Welcome to this service from the Benefice of Rural East York on this, the third Sunday of Advent, when we are reminded of the ministry of John the Baptist. As we wait, we continue to prepare ourselves to celebrate the coming of the incarnate Christ at Christmas. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptised by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then should we do? In reply he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptised, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, 
collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, and we, what should we do? He said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So, with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. I want you to imagine you are there by the River Jordan, where John is baptising the many people who have gathered. You can hear people excitedly running to get there. There is some urgency in what is happening. You might wonder, as you look on from the 21st century, how people knew to go to the Jordan. How did they know about John the Baptizer? Today, if we want to, people to hear news of an event, then social media takes over, and everyone knows within minutes. Instant communication is a way of life for many people now. We can talk to people on the other side of the world as easily as we can talk to people on the other side of the road. We can send a message no matter what distance and receive a reply within a matter of moments. Yet in spite of such sophistication, traditional methods of communication remain. Newspapers are published day by day. TV and radio have their place within our lives and exert their influence upon our outlook and opinions. Word of mouth, though, was obviously very effective in the time of John. You now hear those words, you brood of vipers. Not words you would want to hear anywhere, but certainly not as a welcome to a baptism. I expect some people turned away and went home. Others would wait to hear what John had to say. John knew many of them had come for baptism because it was the thing to do. They were not really repenting, turning away from their sin. Among the crowds would have been the leaders of the Jewish religion, and they certainly would not have been sincere in their desire for baptism. The act of baptism alone cannot save people from their sins. There has to be a repentance and a real belief in Christ then baptism follows as a visible sign of turning away from your old ways and starting a new life with Jesus. The crowds asked John what they had to do, and he gave them very specific things to do. For example, he told the tax collectors to take no more than they should. It was common practice then to take tax for the Roman government but they also took money for themselves, making them very wealthy people. We know they didn't all listen to that, as we read of Jesus meeting with at least two named tax collectors who were still collecting too much money, and they were disliked by the people. Many people thought the sudden appearance of this prophet from the desert was the Messiah they were told to expect. 
They knew from the Old Testament that God would send Christ, and many thought he was coming soon. And so maybe this was the Christ whom God had promised to send. John knew what they were thinking and told the people that he was not the Christ, but he did say that Christ would come soon. He then went on to tell them something about the nature of Christ, so they would be ready for him when he does come. John said that he would not be good enough to do such small thing as to undo the Christ's sandals, a task a servant would do for his master. He also said that he baptised with water, but Christ will baptise with the Holy Spirit and fire. I think hearing this may have made the crowds really wonder who this Christ might be. And what would he be like? John, like Jesus, used a familiar situation, agriculture, to talk about something else Jesus would do. He said that Christ will test people just as a farmer tests his grain. Seeing the farmer beat his grain to separate the good grain from the husk, then throw it all into the air. So the good grain falls straight to the ground, was a familiar sight. The farmer would then put the good grain in a safe store and the husks would blow further away in the wind. The farmer then gathers his rubbish and he burns it with fire. John said Christ will be the judge of all people and he will separate the people who belong to him from others. His people will go to the safety of heaven, but he will punish those who oppose him as with fire. Traditionally, John's stern message provides the basis of the church's teaching for Advent. It reminds us that before we look outwards and forwards to celebrate the coming of Christ among us, we are to look inwards to examine ourselves critically, who we are, what we are, and what we stand for. In the verses prior to today's Gospel passage, Luke tells us that John went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance. Repentance is not a word much in fashion today, but it still carries with it the meaning that we should turn away from ourselves and turn to God instead. The whole purpose of the Advent season. Going back to being at the River Jordan, it's not enough for us to stand there and say, I'm a Christian or I go to church so I'm safe. We each have to make a commitment to ourselves to obey God's ordinances. Before we can do that, sometimes we have to restore our relationship with God and to also restore relationships with our brothers and sisters, those we see day by day and those we see occasionally. For until we are at peace with those around us, we cannot be at peace with God. But this passage doesn't leave us with this thought. It goes on to say that Christ will proclaim good news to the people. We all want to hear good news, especially at the moment. The crowds may have wondered what the good news would be. They were left waiting, just as we are waiting. But we, of course, know what is going to happen. So let us use this waiting time of Advent for us to be ready to welcome Christ. Amen.
Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you promised to be present in power whenever a community of faith is truly gathered in your name. Hear our prayers and make them acceptable before God, interceding for those for whom we pray and for us. Father God, as this pandemic increases with a new variant, thank you for the doctors, nurses and staff of the NHS who care for us when we are sick and who work so hard as an army against an evil thing in the fight against COVID. For the scientists who worked and continue to work against the clock to develop vaccines for our protection and who guide us with ways to keep well. For carers, both professional and personal, who with love, strength and patience give all they have to those in need. Lord, so many are hurting today and you know each one. Give comfort and the hope of Christ to those who are poor, sick, lost, lonely and abused. pray for those we know and love, for our families and friends, and we ask that your Holy Spirit will prompt us in our own prayers, encouraging and guiding us as we pray. We ask this not because we are righteous, but because you are merciful. We pray, Lord, for those in authority. We are saddened when some order their armies to destroy and kill. Ignore the cries of the earth as they burn and ruin the beauty of the planet. Put their own desires before those of their people, yearning for yet more power, more control and more money. Forgive them, Lord, and heal their hearts and minds with your grace and mercy. Hear our prayers, Father, and help us to remember that your ways are not our ways and your thoughts are not our thoughts. In all this, Lord, your will be done in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Thank you for joining us for worship this morning or whenever you chose to join us. So let's ask for God's blessing on us all. Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon us. Scatter the darkness from before our path and make us ready to meet him when he comes in glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Mm-hmm.